And then, uh, did you get your uh, microphone working? Yeah. I pushed record. Pardon? And the number is increasing by one integer per second. So I'm assuming it's working. All right. So I have a lot of slides here. There's a lot of content to cover. Oh, and it doesn't want to show the slides. All right, fine. Um, so if you have questions, I'll try and address them. But don't be offended if I decide to shelve it to the end, and then we can discuss it after, because I don't want to get away in the way of the 3 o'clock. Here's a 3.30 presentation. So, uh, so we're going to talk ZFS. So my presentation is at my website, aarontoponce.org, slash presents, slash ZFS. I'll also have this up at the end of the screen as well, at the end of the presentation, in case you don't get it. And that's my email address. But I have the tarball, the PDF, source code, the whole nine yards. And you're more than welcome to use this presentation under the CC by SA license. I'm OK with that. All right, so let's get talking. First off, motivation. Why do I want to discuss ZFS uh, at all? Well, I have this little short URL. So let's go to it and see what it, what it says. <laughs> This is a Google Trends search. The red line is Google searching for cloud server. The blue line is searching for cloud storage. As we can see, as of 2008-ish, they begin to separate, and cloud storage follows an exponential curve. Uh, and cloud server seems to be making only up like 15, 18% of those searches. So storage is a hot topic, and it's something that's difficult to get right, uh, and it takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of experience, a lot of patience, and a lot of architecture. So we'll look at that, and I think ZFS is a good fit for that. Uh, Dave Wellman, at his Hadoop presentation yesterday, for those of you who went to that, uh, gave an interesting uh, analogy for big data. He said, consider a grain of rice representing one byte. Then a kilobyte would be a cup of rice. A megabyte would be eight bags of rice. I don't know if that's a pound or a kilogram. Uh, a gigabyte would be three 53 foot semi trailers chuck full of rice. A terabyte would be two full container ships. A petabyte, a three inch blanket of rice covering Manhattan. An exabyte, a blanket of rice covering California, Oregon, and Washington together. A zettabyte would be enough to fill up the entire Pacific Ocean. And a Yoda bite would uh, be a rice ball sized of Earth. Yes. That's supposed to be a joke. All right. <laughs> so anyway, we can kind of see that this is, it, it kind of shows an exponential curve in terms of, of data storage. So what is ZFS? ZFS is a 128-bit file system. Actually, technically, if you look at the details, you find that there's nothing 128 bits implemented in it. Even though everybody says that it is. The, but you can create two to the 74 file systems. You can have two to the 74 power pools. So it's big, and we can address exabytes of data with ZFS. But that just because I can doesn't mean I should, right? Uh, ZFS is a copy on write file system. Uh, copy on write is a new data storage technique where instead of modifying the data in place, I make a copy of it and then store the new data in a new set of blocks. ZFS is a combined file system, uh, volume manager, and RAID manager. So instead of having separate utilities for all of it, it comes in one. I've got native support for SSDs, both caching and writing. It supports deduplication and compression for saving disk. Uh, it does support encryption. ZFS was developed by Sun Microsystems. It was released in 2005. And it was initially proprietary software, but the community pressured them into releasing it as open source. So they released it under the Sun Cuddle license, which unfortunately is incompatible with the GPL. So it will never be mainline in the Linux kernel, unless the kernel decides to change their license. Oracle purchased Sun Microsystems in, two, what was it, 2008-ish, 2009, and they closed up, unfortunately, the source code to ZFS. And they released the encryption bit after that acquisition. So we don't have access to that source code. So the ZFS 
source code itself is closed? Is there like an open source fork of it? Then, no, so the, so the source that we had up to that point was released under the Cuddle license, and we're entitled under law to have access to it and use it. So we have used up to that point. After Oracle took it with it, we don't have access to it. So what I'm going to show you is the native Sun source code from 2005 to 2008 okay. or nine. Okay. Uh, ZFS checksums everything top to bottom. This includes data blocks and metadata. Uh, and it, was, it doesn't take any legacy ideas. Nothing is borrowed from UFS. Nothing is borrowed from Berkeley's fast file system or XT3 or any other file system for that matter. It was completely rethought of, completely redesigned. Uh, and I think you'll see that as we go along. So let's talk about the copy on write nature of ZFS first. As I mentioned, it's a new data storage technique. Instead of modifying the blocks in place, I make a copy of those blocks and store them in a new location with my updated change. With ZFS, these writes are done as a transaction group. And that transaction group is committed atomically, which means the disk gets all of the data or it gets none of the data. It never gets partial data. And if you're familiar with uh, relational database management systems and you're familiar with ACID compliance, right, then you're already familiar with this. The A in ACID stands for atomic. So with the database, you either get the update or you don't. You don't get part of the update, right? And if for any reason the transaction fails, I need to have the ability to go back and have the database in the, con the consistent state it was before that transaction was opened, right? Z so Z you could think of ZFS as mimicking a more a database approach to data storage than a traditional file system approach because it follows the same, the same pattern. It uses a hash tree, also referred to as a Merkle tree. This Merkle tree, it's, uh, you can think of it as like a binary tree, although it doesn't necessarily have to be binary. But there will be a single root node, and then we have tree nodes, branches following after. We keep track of versions. So when I need to update a file, make some modifications, that Merkle tree knows what version that file is already and what pointers are pointing to those blocks. When I go to update the file, I update the Merkle tree and say, now my file, my updated file, is in this location and it has this new version. What's nice about this is this sets up a sweet ability to do snapshots and rollbacks. Now that I have a version history, basically, of my file because of the copy on write nature and the Merkle tree, I can, I can roll back, do like a regular consistent snapshots, and if for any reason I have data corruption or missed files, I can go back to a previous snapshot and go from there. Are these snapshots on like a file system level or for like an individual file, like I'm working on an open office document or something? I'll show you. I have a full slide on snapshots. So if I don't answer your question when we get there, let me know. Um, so basically all these snapshots are doing are keeping track of the Merkle tree in the state it's in. I don't have any need for a FISC. There's no FISC with ZFS. Because everything's atomic, I either have the data or I don't. I don't have inconsistent data. And that's the whole point of a FISC, is to fix inconsistent data. If you think of how like XT4 works, it's a journal file system. I have to open up the journal, right, and tell the journal, here's what I'm going to do. And then I make writes to the inode, then I make writes to the block, and then I close the journal. It's done sequentially, and even writing the blocks are done sequentially. If there's a power outage somewhere in that sequence, then when the system comes back on, the journal says, hey, I'm in an inconsistent state. We need to FISC, okay? And because of the journal, it's a smart FISC. It knows, ah, here's where I need to focus my attention rather than scanning the full file system. Instead, ZFS scrubs data, and I have a whole slide on scrubbing, so I'll hold on to that. What I want to mention first and foremost, the ZFS that I'll be discussing is for a native kernel module running in kernel space. I've had a lot of people ask me, hey, so this is the Fuse project, right? No, this isn't. Nothing that there's anything wrong with that. In fact, technically speaking, you can write a file system in Fuse that can be just about as native fast as kernel space. Just because it's in user space doesn't mean it's slow. It's in RAM. 
but <laughs> but this is the kernel space kernel module and I'll be discussing it. So you can get the source code and uh, some tarballs at zfsonlinux.org. There's an Ubuntu PPA, so you just it updates your sources.list and then you just apt-get update, apt-get install Ubuntu ZFS. If you're running Debian or Gentoo or Fedora or Sabay Sabayon, I don't know how you pronounce it, or some other distros that they have listed on their website, they have instructions on how to do it. So for Debian, I could wget this deb, I just put it in a short URL so it fit on the screen, otherwise it wrapped two lines. And you'll get this dev file, you depackage that dev file, and that will set up your repository. And then you just app get update, app get install Debian ZFS, and you're ready to roll. You've got the ZFS kernel module loaded in the kernel, you've got all the user space utilities, you've got the man pages. As far as you are concerned, your system is ready for ZFS. One thing with ZFS that differs from standard traditional Unix file systems is it's three commands, one of which I guarantee you'll never use. The first is zpool, and we'll go over extensive use of zpool here in a second. But zpool sets up your ZFS pool, sets up your RAID, sets up you know, some properties on how you're gonna manage your pool. The ZFS command configures data sets or file systems, compression, deduplication, things like that. ZDP, ZDB, uh, is the utility I guarantee you'll never use, and you shouldn't need it. But in the likely, unlikely event that you do need to use it, it is a utility for displaying debugging information, pool consistency information, and even making changes. So let me uh, just go to zfsonlinux.org, and there's packages there for everything. Uh, with ZDB, it does have the ability to modify blocks directly. It's kind of like having a surgeon's scalpel and being ready to prep the patient. So let me just tell you that there be dragons ahead when you start playing with ZDB. And in fact, intentionally, there are switches in ZDB that are not in the man page. They're intentionally hidden to keep you from screwing up your data set. <laughs> So, FYI. All right, so let's do, I'm gonna go over some command stuff. I do plan on having a demo, so hang tight. But I'm gonna go through a, hand, a handful of slides. And I'm gonna give us the abstract kind of concepts with some commands, and then we'll demo it on my laptop. And I've already got ZFS installed on my laptop, and we'll work on it from there. So to create a pool, it's as simple as zpool create. I give the pool a name, in this case I'm naming it tank. And then I give it the devices that I want to use. Any exportable block device found under slash dev is valid. So I don't have to say slash dev SDA, slash dev SDB, slash dev SDC. I can say SDA, SDB, SDC. And it'll look in slash dev for those block devices, okay? And then I can run zpool status on my tank and see the health of it. So that's a basic, as basic as it gets, creating a simple zpool. Let's get into the concept of VDEVs. VDEVs are virtual devices. For those of you who are familiar with software RAID, Linux software RAID specifically, when you create a software RAID device, it exports out to you DevMD1 or DevMD0 or whatever, right? You have an exportable block device that you make FS or that you add to your volume group. That device, that MD0 device, you can think of as a virtual device that represents your disks, right? ZFS is the same way, but it doesn't give us a virtual device, and I'll show that. But we do have the, the, the same concept. There's seven VDEVs. One th important thing is ZFS stripes across the VDEVs always, okay? So keep that in mind. And I'll illustrate it on the board. So the seven VDEVs are disk, which this previous slide showed. I'm using three disks. There's file, mirror, RAID Z, spare, log, and cache. And I'll go over each of these. So for the disk VDEV, we saw that was zpool create tank SDA BC. They can be a full path or they can be those anything found in slash dev. It's best practice that you use the devices found under dev disk by ID. Reason why 
is your motherboard may not present the disks in the same order after boot. SDB this boot might be SDC the next boot, right? The UUID or? Yep, so there is dev disk by UUID. In this case, by ID, you guys can see that, right? Um, these are whether or not it's ATA, SCSI, and then it gives the model number and the serial number. And if there's partitions, the partition's on it as well. So it'll be that disk. So it'll always be that disk. If it's SDA one boot and SDF the next, it doesn't matter. It's still that disk, right? So it's best practice to use these guys because they're attached to the physical device. Can you right. need dev to do all the methods? You, um, you could use UDEV. Um, I wouldn't recommend it, though. I would stick this way. With the soft RAID, the RAID usually will figure out from the RAID data which drives you have, right? And we can reassemble if the letters change. ZFS will as well. However, there's a caveat that I want to get to when we talk about the cache device. So, um, so stick with this. Trust me, and I'll explain why it's a good idea in a few slides. Okay. Um, okay. So VDEVs are striped. And because I'm using disks in this case, then each disk is a VDEV. VDEVs are always striped. This means I'm creating a RAID 0, right? OK. So in this case, Z pull create tank SDABC. This is a VDEV. That's a VDEV. That's a VDEV. There's three VDEVs. VDEVs are always striped. This is a RAID 0. Let's look at the file VDEV. The file VDEV is awesome. I think this is cool. You can create pre-allocated image files and then use those to set up your pool. What's nice about this is this is great for just setting up a quick little test environment. You're developing a Python script or a C utility or something that is going to work with ZFS and you want to make sure you get it right. You don't want to run it on production data. So let's just set up some one gig files, throw them together and test our script and see if it works. Then we're done, we can tear it down, no harm, no foul, right? Which means, obviously, you don't want to use files for production. In fact, Since stay away from that. Dev, then you have to specify slash. You know, Bingo. Now, because it's not in dev, I have to specify the full path. Not an absolute path, the full path. Right? So temp file one, here's a pre-allocated file. And these can't be sparse files. They have to be pre-allocated. Okay? So you can use dd, or truncate, or f-allocate, whatever to build a pre-allocated file. So there's three VDEVs again. File, file, file. Again, it's going to be a striped RAID 0 pool. Doesn't truncate make it sparse? <laughs> no, truncate actually says whatever blocks are in that area are pre-allocated. So there's no actually holes. It's just use what you got. OK, let's look at the mirror VDEV. So now it's a little bit different. A mirror VDEV, first off, is your standard RAID 1. Every device gets the exact same data as all the others. They're a mirror copy of each other, right? You need two or more disks, obviously. But now look at the difference. I say Z pool create tank mirror. Now this becomes my VDEV. So this is one VDEV. With MDADM, this might be dev MD0, right? So this is my, my single VDEV. So that means then, what if I wanted to create a RAID 10? So I did zpool create tank mirror. I say SDA, SDB. So this is one VDEV, right? RAID 0? No, this is a mirror. So let's create another one, SDC, SDD. This is another VDEV, right? And as I go, as I go, I could do a RAID Z, RAID Z1, RAID Z2. I wouldn't want to do this, but now this is where the stripe comes into play, right? So I wanted a RAID 10. That's my RAID 10. Here's my mirror, here's my mirror, here's my stripe. That makes sense? We're always striped across VDEVs. So I wanted to write it in this manner so it's kind of easier to see. Make sense? 
Okay. Yeah. So SDB is a both those meters? Uh, that's. Uh, you don't want to use the same one. Yeah, you don't want to do. <laughs> my bad. Sorry. I actually like. My wife says I'm dyslexic, because I'll write down B when I mean D, or I'll put, <laughs> I'll say one thing and write another, or I'll put like, so yeah. The magic word mirror means like RAID 1, like make them the same? Yeah, so these are RAID 1. Because you said mirror. Right? Exactly. So these two are mirrors of each other. And then I say again, mirror or. And these two are the same. But this is one VDEV. That's another VDEV. VDEVs are always striped. So the stripe goes across those two VDEVs. Tank mirror SDSDB, then Zipol create tank mirror. Nope. Nope. Or you're creating two different ones, so you're creating a third one. Yeah, so you type it. Those mirrors as VDEVs. You would type it out as uh, Zipol create tank mirror SDA SDB mirror SDC SDD mirror SDE SDF, nice. right? Oh. I just wanted to do it this way so it illustrates a little bit better, but it would be one long command. Yep. But you said it doesn't create other devices that you could raise. Right, there is no exportable block device. I'll explain that in a sec. Yeah, so there is no device that represents this VDEV in slash dev. Okay, so that's something that is different, that's going to take a little bit getting used to. Well, how but, does it know that's a RAID 10 then? Oh. Because it's all in one line? No, I'll explain it. So, well, so the way it knows it's a RAID 10, when, when you're doing this, you're formatting your disks. Think of this as like a MakeFS, very similar, although it's doing RAID too, right? It's putting metadata down on SDA and SDB that says these are part of VDEV 1, and it's putting metadata down on here that's saying this is part of VDEV 2, both of these are mirrors, and then by default we just stripe across all the VDEVs. But all the metadata, all of that is on the disk. How would you specify like a spare? Yep. Okay. So let's look at the RAID Z V devs then. There's three RAID Z V devs RAID Z1, RAID Z2, RAID Z3. RAID Z1 is analogous to a RAID 5, to a standardized RAID 5. I say analogous because it's not the same. It is a single distributed parity. So you will have a parity that distributes itself across all the disks in the pool. And the other disks are striped. Right? However, it differs in that a standard RAID 5, the stripe width is the width of all of the disks in, in the array. If you have three disks, your stripe width covers all three disks. With ZFS, that stripe width is dynamic. If I don't need to cover all three disks, I only need to cover two, then I put the data on one, put the parity on the other, and I'm ready to roll. If it needs to cover three different stripe widths. I just make sure I've got a parity distributed on each of the stripes as needed. So the width is 100% dynamic. And because ZFS is managing all of the metadata, it's managing the pool, it's managing the RAID, it's managing everything, it knows where to find this data. It's smart about itself. I don't, unlike, unlike Linux software RAID, it has no idea what the data is that it's managing. It only knows, here's incoming data, I'm a mirror, I need to copy it on both spots. But it doesn't know what that data is. It doesn't know where the boundaries are for files. So that's why we have to keep that stripe width across all of the disks. That makes sense? MDADM is dumb with XT4 and vice versa. But ZFS is managing the whole thing top to bottom. So RAID Z1, single distributed parity. RAID Z2 is a dual distributed parity, similar to RAID 6. And then RAID Z3 is a triple distributed parity. And in fact, there was, uh, well, not was, there is a proposal to introduce a RAID 7, a standardized RAID 7, that would have a triple distributed parity. That would just be the logical continuation of RAID 5 and 6. But here's some examples. Zpool create tank RAID Z1, SDABC. Three disks are needed for a RAID Z1 as a minimum. Four disks for RAID Z2, five disks for RAID Z3. Okay. Cool. You can move three disks for RAID Z3. Correct. Still have all your data. And still have all your data. Absolutely. Yep. 
Oops. Okay, let's look at the other VDEVs then. I said there's seven, we've only looked at four. So let's look at the last three. Spare VDEV, spare is what's needed to replace failed disks. A log VDEV is a write intensive separate logging device that stores what's called the ZFS intent log. We'll talk about that in a sec. And then there is a cache device, which is a read intensive cache. Typically you want your log and your cache to be on fast SSDs. So let's say I had my zpool already created, and then I wanted to add a spare to it. I could say zpool add, give it my pool name, spare SDA, or add log. And in this case, remember, this is the VDEV, but I can mirror my devices in the log. So that's perfectly valid. And I'll see why you would want to do this in a second. Or I could put two devices in my cache VDEV. Okay, so let's talk about separate intent log. I'll talk about the cache, then we'll do a demo. So the separate intent log, let me preface by saying, I'm gonna have at the end of the slide my blog. I've put up, I think 21 posts so far about ZFS in great, painstaking, jaw-dropping, boring detail, okay? And I have a full post dedicated to this log, a full post dedicated to the arc, and everything else. I'd recommend you go and read those because I'm gonna gloss over all those details right now. However, the separate intent log stores what's called the ZIL, or the ZFS intent log. The ZFS intent log you can think of as a file, okay? Think about how journaled file systems work and the ZIL will make sense. The journaled file system, you open up the journal and you commit data to the journal saying, here's the blocks I'm gonna to commit to disk, and here's their location, here's the I node that I'm gonna update. It's a journal, right? The Zill's the same, very, very similar. ZFS, when I have my transaction group, remember my data is committed as a transaction group. When I have my transaction group, I store that in the Zill. When that is safely stored in the ZIL, ZFS comes back and acts the write. Says we've got it in the ZIL. You can go ahead and flush this to stable storage. Why would I want to do that? In the event of a catastrophe, let's say a power outage, right? If there is data still in the ZIL, then when the boot comes back up, ZFS will read the ZIL. It's the only time that the ZIL gets read. And it'll say, oh, you've got a transaction group here that has not been committed to platter disk. I'll take that data out of the ZIL and flush it to disk for you. That means your ZIL contains the data you intend to write. It is a ZFS intent log. The data you want to write to your pool is actually written twice. Once to the ZIL, once to stable storage. Okay? Right, go ahead. How did you compare in size then? Um, the ZIL can be really, really small. Uh, by default, ZFS, so if you think of it this way, well, yeah, keep it high. In fact, I've already got it. Let me just go to my blog and I'll show you there. So I already spent, oops, I think I mistyped. So here is how the ZIL works. This, by default, if you do not have a separate logging device, okay, you didn't add, when you said zpool create, you didn't provide log as a valid VDEV. Your ZIL will reside on slow platter disk. Now your application is already running in RAM. Okay? I just pulled it out to make the illustration a little more clean. But your application is running in RAM. Vim, Chrome, whatever, right? It's in RAM. So you want to commit data to disk. It commits data to the ZIL first. Then ZFS comes back and says, I've got it. At which point, your data that you want on slow platter disk is flushed out of RAM to that slow platter disk. Then the next write, we just send the data to the ZIL again. We don't care what was there before, we just clobber over it and we continue the process. If I have a separate logging device, that ZIL moves off the platter disk to 
that logging device. That's why it's called a separate logging device, because now the log is here, not there. If this is fast SSD or an NVRAM, then my ACK back to the application is substantially faster, right? Now I send the data and it comes back saying I've got it. It burns the SSD. So, so yeah, so this is write intensive. So you'll want an SSD that can take the hit. NVRAM drives obviously won't burn out. So bonus if you can afford the NVRAM drives. But like an Intel 330 series SSD will work sufficient for this matter. This log, in my practice, my experience, only needs to be about a gig in size. If you only form, use the first eight gigs or whatever of the 30 gig SSD, it doesn't burn out. So it just now ZFS, the whole thing has it ZFS does have wear leveling algorithms, and your, your SSD will too. So if it's a 40 gig SSD, traditional processes are uh, 23 nanometer currently for the going SSDs, that means you can get about a thousand writes out of your cells before they're about to die. But it'll wear through the full disk before coming back. So you can get 40 gigs times a thousand, or 40 terabytes worth of writes before you need to worry about your disk throwing up, right? Right. So, um, but, however, what's important is that regardless, let's say, I mean, maybe we have a write intensive database or we have a write intensive server, we will flush, by default, we will flush the transaction groups out of RAM at least, or let me say at the most, every five seconds, okay? So worst case scenario, if you have a power outage, you've got five second old data, at very worst, right? You don't have inconsistent data, there's no data corruption, just old, right? And if you're curious, if you want to do an asynchronous write, the ZIL actually technically moves to RAM. You still write to the ZIL, the RAM acts back, and then you flush to flush the disk. Okay, and that, make, that brings up a good point, that the logging device is for synchronous writes only. Asynchronous writes will not go to your slog. They won't be used. So, and again, I am glossing over some details. If you're really interested, you could read the zil.c source code, or you could go to my blog, and I get a little more detailed there. Okay. I'm watching the time, because I still got a lot to go through. Uh, the adjustable replacement cache. This is an implementation of IBM's adaptive read cache. Traditional Linux caching has a most recently used and the least recently used. Think of it like a conveyor belt. I read a block off of platter disk and I put it on my conveyor belt. The conveyor belt is representative of time. The longer it's on the conveyor belt, the further away from the source it is. Until a certain point where it just drops off and I have to grab it from platter again, right? So I have this most recently used, least recently used. And if I want to reread a block that hasn't dropped a platter, it's still in the cache, I just grab it and put it back at the beginning, right? Standard conveyor belt style. ZFS is, the ZFS adjustable replacement cache, or the ARC, is a little bit more smart. Not only does it manage uh, the most recently used, but it also manages most frequently used, okay? So it actually keeps in the cache which blocks have been used recently and which ones have been used frequently. So we store these pages in the ARC, which is in main RAM, in main system memory. Now the ARC, by default, in Linux, unfortunately, and this is a bug, and it's been addressed, uh, it will consume all of your RAM. So if you don't uh, rail this guy in, he will consume RAM, and then the kernel will start oom killing stuff. So you could, uh, and I mentioned this in my blog, uh, but you can set up a ZFS module config, and then just say the max arc size is blah. The so traditional recommendation is 25% of your RAM. So I've got 32 gigs in my server. Let's dedicate eight gigs to the arc, okay? Okay, so eight gigs of RAM. When that eight gigs fills up, it will drop to a level two arc, or the L2 arc. This is where my cache VDEV comes into play. When I say zpool create tank, 
mirror SDA, SDB, cache SDC, that will be the level two cache. This also should be fast SSD, because what happens is, like the conveyor belt style, uh, these most frequently used and most recently used pages, the least frequently and least recently used will drop to the level two cache until that fills up. Then they're just dropped out of cache entirely and I've got to pull it back from disk. Okay? So I want my level two cache to be snappy fast. MVRAM would work. SSDs are great for this. Uh, it's not write intensive, although I am writing data to it. It's largely read intensive. And you can afford to stripe these guys because it's a cache. If the system dies, just rebuild the cache after the next boot. I mean, you've, the data is consistent on platter disk, right? Okay, it's volatile. It's volatile. Yep. Doesn't need to be battery backed. Doesn't need to be consistent. Nope. Okay. It should be very large, however. The more you can donate to your level two arc, the better off you are. Okay, so I have the PDF. You can read the handout. Let's do a demo. I have here seven 16 gigabyte USB thumb drives. Okay. <laughs> but they're valid disks. All off of one hub, huh? All off of one hub. That's right. 2.0 or 3.0? 2.0. We're not going to benchmark. Yeah, it's actually, it's not bad. So, just to verify that I'm not like doing any voodoo under the hood, right? Uh, oh, that's interesting. I wonder where those came from. No, I've only got one drive in here. Well, Z pool status. No pools available. So we don't have any pools. Let's plug in and create a pool. We'll wait a sec for the drives to get queried. BCD, EF. I think we're good. BCD, EFGH. All right, we got all seven. Okay. And Z pool status. No pools. So let's create a pool. So I'm going to create a RAID 10 with a mirrored log and then a cache. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll say Z pool create tank. And I'm going to mirror SDB and SDC. I know SDA is my root hard drive. So I'm safe going SDB and SDC. Then I'm going to mirror SDD and SDE. Then I'm going to log and I want to mirror these devices in that log, SDF and SDG, and then I'm going to cache SDH. Clear as mud? Oops. Dash F, they were already part of the... Um, part of a previous Z pool. So it had metadata on there, and it's like, whoa, I don't want, are you sure you want to do this? It shouldn't take this long. Uh oh. Wrong drive. Maybe I've got a dead disk. Uh, all right, sweet. Demos never go well, you know that? It doesn't matter how many times I practice this, it never matters, it always fails. So let's, we might have to, still going. And it won't die, the only way to like, I won't be able to kill dash nine it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you. Nope. All right, we're gonna reboot, please hang tight. The fact that it had uh, some devices hanging over from my it was a sign that I'm in a bad state. So let's get a clean state going. <clears throat> By the, while we're waiting this for the, to reboot, are there any questions up to this point? Does ZFS let you, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Does ZFS let you know when a disk has failed? Like, what happened? Yes. In, so ZFS does not have, does not do any smart monitoring. You'll need to use the smart tools to do that. But if a disk does die, it will send a mail to the mail system saying we're in a bad state. Yeah. Yep. Can Absolutely. You use ZSF for the OS? 
Uh huh. You can. Um, it's not. It's still buggy to use as a root file system, but I use it on my workstation for slash home slash var log and slash var cache, so and it works well. Starts, then it can... Yeah, then I mount it. You and then you. I may have asked my question, so I was wondering if you are going to use it for your root file system. You probably have to set up a init RAM disk, because you can't yeah. compile it into the kernel, so the module has to stay that way, right? Or, I don't know, that would be something, that's why it's bugging me. Say again, sorry. Well, I was just wondering if it's something that you could like, compile into the module, so you, into the kernel, so you don't need a separate module in a init RAM disk to get the root, root FS. it up. Oh, to get root FS? I guess you don't want it on your root anyways, and that's moved. Um, the, the big problem with the rootfs on ZFS right now is grub support. Uh, grub being able to assemble the disks so we can get the kernel out of it and continue the process. Uh, grub was patched for Solaris when Open Solaris was around, uh, but those patches seem to be spotty with GNU. So, so does that mean that Having it as your root file system is easier if your boot is not CFS. Yeah, so my, my root file system is XT4, and then I've cherry picked directories out of there to use for ZFS. Oh, yeah. I mean, Grub's only got to understand the boot partition. Correct, so exactly. So, my question is talk to me about not being able to kill it and having to reboot, because that makes me go, ooh. Okay, so, so this is a ZFS is a kernel. I, it, it's a kernel module, and so it's loaded into the kernel. And so the fact that there were some bad state with my drives from doing my examples this morning before I drove in, the yeah, it's, it's exactly, means that the kernel module's gotten into a bad state. Now I could use ZDB <laughs> and dive into it and figure it out and fix it. I'm not experienced with ZDB, and I don't trust myself doing it. So, so the best way is just to unload the module and then load it back in. And I could have done that. I could have done a mod probe dash R ZFS. But given the state we were in, I think a clean or reboot would just would have been best off. Okay. But that this is because I was playing with it this morning, put my laptop in standby, unplugged everything, threw it in my bag, came here. And so, yeah. So um, I have a friend who is a huge fan of ZFS, but he ran it on Solaris. I don't know Solaris for the life of me. What, rec what OS, I, what if it's a little late, but what OSs do you recommend or do you think there's the best support for it? I'm showing this running on Debian, and there's 100% support for it. Um, we don't have, like, there's still some things like the ARC consuming all of RAM and then the kernel loom killer stepping in that we have concerns with. So there's stuff that's not golden yet, but 99.9% .9 of the features are there. So, I mean, installed on Ubuntu, installed on Arch, installed on Gentoo, installed on Debian. What about Red Hat? Red Hat, Fedora, yep, it's all there. It's, it's a kernel, Linux kernel module, so wherever the Linux kernel is, you're good to go. All right, and I am so severely running out of time, and we have a lot to cover. So, all right, we were going to... Let's try my live demo again. All right. So ls dev sd one. That's the root. Yep, that's root. Let's give it a second. Should start populating. There's B and D, and we're good. Okay. So let's go back to my Z pool and run it. Please work. <laughs> This is garbage. <laughs> Doesn't really instill a lot of faith, does it? Let's see. Still going. Well, I we're gonna have to move. Hey, we got it. Did it finish? It finished. Yay! And I've got five minutes to finish through the rest of my slides. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I did a Z pool status. Remember my VDEVs? Here's VDEV1, called mirror zero, SDB and SDC. VDEV2, SDB and SE. Here's a log, VDEV, and I'm mirroring these guys, and then my cache. So here, I'm using three different VDEVs, right? Okay, so we created it, yay. All right, let's go back here. 
because now I've got to get through the rest, and I've got five minutes. So we can export and import pools. Exporting your Z pool will take all of will take the Z pool offline. It's a, it's the same as an unmount, right? But it keeps everything in a consistent state. If I had time, I would export it, unplug all the USB sticks, mix them up in a hat, plug them all back in in random order, and then zpool import, and everything would import cleanly. All of the metadata is on the disks. ZFS knows how to reassemble the necessary drives. But here's the caveat that I mentioned earlier. The reason you want to use the dev disk by ID stuff, and not SDA, SDB, SDC, is if, let's say, your cache device is SDC. Okay. The next time it boots up, let's say one of the drives in your pool shows up as FDC, SDC. It's going to try and become the cache, and your cache device is now going to be a part of the pool. You're going to get data corruption. Okay? This is a problem with the way the Linux kernel does devices. So that's why you want to use the def disk by ID stuff. It is. It is, but no, on the cache, there is no metadata. It's a cache. There's no, there's no metadata there. Okay, so this gives me the ability to migrate my disks from one physical box to another physical box, like hardware upgrades. Scrub and resilvering. Because everything is checksummed top to bottom, I can read the data and say, is this data consistent? Well, let's hash it with SHA-256 and see if the sum matches. If the sum matches, the data is in good order. If the sum doesn't match, we have corrupted data. Now what's nice is ZFS will auto-heal itself if you have redundancy. So like in the case of a mirror, let's say the application wants to read data. So it goes to a, you have a mirror of disks. Here's your app. Let's say it reads from this disk to get the block. And let's say that it fails. The checksum does not match. We have bad data. ZFS will not give it to the application. Well, I've got a mirror. Let's go over here and read the block. Hey, the checksum matches. We'll send this to the app, but then we'll also fix this block. I've got a good block. <coughs> Why not fix it in the other side of the pool? Oh, right? If it failed, then it would fail. Right. Like, Correct. I mean, if it shows here first, it wouldn't know any better, right? Right. Okay, so that's why it's a good idea to scrub. This is what a scrub does, is it reads the data, checks the SHA-256 sums. If they don't match, look elsewhere in the pool for a fix and fix it. Or report back saying, I don't have good data here, you've got bad data, right? It's recommended that for SATA disks, you scrub weekly. If you've got SAS disks, you, can go, you could go monthly. Okay? Uh, and then resilvering if a drive fails, and I put a new drive in, then I say, oh, this drive used to have this data, but it doesn't any longer. So the resilver is rebuilding the data on that drive. An advantage here is, unlike MDADM, ZFS knows what data is missing. So I don't have to scan all of the blocks from the start of the pool to the end of the pool to get that missing data. I only have to say, oh, I'm only missing one gig. Let's put that one gig on the, on the bad drive. So an example on the last slide, is it replacing this SDE with this SDE? Yes, yes. Yep. So let's say you're going to drive out bad drive, put a new one in, and you replace SDE with SDE. Can yeah, just, just exactly that. Yeah, if you take the drive out, um, and the device SDE goes away, and you put the new drive in, and it comes back as SDE. It's just that. Z pool replace tank SDE SDE. Yep. Or, but you should follow the dev disk by ID format, then it'll be a little bit better. Okay. I'm out of time. When is the next talk card? Three? Can I, can I go five minutes after? Can I go five minutes after? Okay. I'll hurry. Hold your questions to the end. Okay, so there are zpool properties. Auto expand will auto expand your pool. If you have a pool of one terabyte disks and you replace them with all two terabyte disks, you can have the pool automatically expand to the new storage. However, it's off by default, so you have to turn it on. Uh, same with auto replace. If you have a spare, a drive dies, it won't replace it by default. So if you set that to on, then it'll work. Health will show the status of the pool. Have you ever used that? Sorry. No. 
And I haven't. I've turned them on just in case, but I haven't. I haven't used it. Best practices, it should be a 64-bit system. You should use gobs of ECC RAM, and it should be ECC, not non-ECC RAM, because you do have the ARC in RAM. It is important that that remains consistent, too. You should use whole disks. Uh, I'll let you read through the rest of this because we're in a hurry. All right, so let's create some data sets then. So data sets are our file system, and we use the ZFS utility for making those, okay? And the way it works is, so I have my tank. I say ZFS create. We'll say tank slash, and then I give it a, the data set a name. We'll say uh, fail. ZFS list will show me my data sets. Now I want you to show something. Look at the mount point. I haven't mounted anything. All I've done was a zpool create and a ZFS create. But by default, it's already mounted. This is what's nice, a nice feature with ZFS. I don't have to create the RAID, make the file system, and mount. Is that a slash tank folder? Like, mm -hmm. the yeah. Yep. So the slash tank is created. Slash tank create fail. And there's where my data is. Compression. ZFS supports transparent compression. Uh, with the Solaris compression, we had LZJB, GZIP, and ZLE. ZFS on Linux, uh, as of 0 0.6.1, supports LZ4, which is faster than the other compression algorithms, uses less CPU, and gives us really tight compression ratios. LZ4 for the win. So if I wanted to turn that on, I can just set that property. ZFS set compression equals, give it what I want, and go. So let's look at, oops, ZFS git compress. It's off, so I'll ZFS set compress equals LZ4. Now it's on. Now when I store data in slash tank slash fail, it gets compressed by default. From my perspective, I don't know it's compressed. Here's a PDF. I open the PDF in my PDF viewer and I'm good. But from ZFS perspective, it's compressed the data underneath. Two big benefits here. One, storage savings. I'm not consuming as much disk. But two, disk access speed increases. Because there's less data stored physically on disk, that's less disk that I physically have to seek to get the data off. So I'm going to get massive performance improvements. So if you set that right now, a file that you created for that is not compressed? Correct. It's not retroactive. Update or the new version of that file would be. Yeah, well, the new blocks would be, oh, yes. Okay. So in the metadata, it will say this block is gzip1, this block is gzip9, this right block is. Like yeah, yep. So over time, everything will eventually, hopefully, migrate to it, but yeah. Deduplication, it supports block level deduplication. It stores everything in a deduplication table saying this block is stored elsewhere. So instead of creating the new block on the disk, just refer here. But I have to store that in a table which is in RAM. The deduplication table will occupy 25% of your arc. Your arc is occupying 25% of your disk. The rule of thumb is five gigabytes for every terabyte of disk in your pool. So five gigs at 25% of the arc means my arc has to be 20 gigs. The arc is 25% of my RAM. That means I need 80 gigs of RAM for one terabyte of disk. So your deduplication table is huge. And this is important because if it spills out of arc, it will spill to the level two arc. If it spills out of that, it'll spill to slow platter disk and there goes your performance. It'll go to snot, okay? Snapshots and clones. I can create snapshots with the at and then give it a snapshot name, and it's a first class file system. I say ZFS snapshot tank store at 001 in this case, and I have a copy of what the data looked like at that specific point in time. And it is a legitimate file system. It's read only, it's immutable, but I have access. I can send and receive snapshots over the network. So if I have an offsite backup server, I can ZFS send this file system pipe to SSH, ZFS receive, and store it in this file system. Okay? It streams to SDN and SD out. 
Zvols are the only block devices you get with ZFS. Creating a Zvol allows you to export a block device. This could be useful on hypervisors where maybe you're creating disks for your VMs. Okay? You could create a Zvol on ZFS, maybe give it 10 gigs, and then when you're creating your VM on the hypervisor, have it use that Zvol for its storage. And then, by default, your VM gets the benefit of ZFS underneath. ZFS supports native NFS, Samba, and iSCSI sharing. You just have to turn the setting on. <laughs> ZFS set share NFS equals on. There's a number of different data set properties. Here's a few, whether or not you want it to be synchronous, the mount point, uh, and then some best practices. I would say do compression. It's cheap. Processors are fast to snot these days. It doesn't hurt you, so and you get all these great benefits. Snapshot regularly and frequently. Uh, send your snapshots off-site. Uh, this is what I was talking about here. Um, put this in slash etsy slash mobprobe.d zfs.conf and then that will cap your arc at a specific size. In that case, that's two gigs. So here's my resources. Again, there's my blog about ZFS. Uh, here's, there's my presentation as well as my email. So I wish I had more time. I, I really do. And you're more than welcome to come ask me questions. But are there any questions at this point? We're up against the hour. All right. Thanks, guys.